uh, Jeremy Glassenberg. And where Jeremy will tell us a little bit like the challenge of API design in fintech, right? What are the opportunities for designing great APIs uh, in fintech? Not only the business side, but also the, the design. Hello, Jeremy. How are you? Hey, doing well. How are you doing over here? We're doing well. Uh, we uh, we know we are in GMT, right? And uh, that you are in US time zone, so it's a little bit early, but thank you for making it possible, uh, right? And uh, yeah, I invite you to share your screen. Uh, so we can uh, your presentation. All right. Yeah, it's times like these. I do wish I was in New York, or it would have been closer <laughs> to eight a.m. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Let's go. Uh, let's go for uh, uh, twenty-five minutes. Thank you, Jeremy. Sounds good. And I uh, hope the audio is okay. We'll have to be a little quiet this morning, um, but I think we are good to go here. So. Thank you all uh, for your interest in all of these FinTech API talks. Uh, today, I will be focused on um, really just first giving an overview of the modern history of FinTech APIs and going into some trends and tips on more of the API design and technical level for those who are working with or designing FinTech APIs. And finally, get into some pr future prospects for those of you who are looking to design your APIs that you design them for, for really the scale and the future of these fintech apis uh, i see that uh open banking is on the agenda quite a bit today and i'll get into it a little bit but not as much as others have so i'll try going through that bit quickly and focusing on some more content on fintech api trends in general first of all my most uh heated slide of any presentation where i have to actually talk about myself uh, basically, I have been working in product management and product design specifically for APIs for a little over 12 years now. And in a wide range of industries, uh, I've been in various parts of enterprise technology and supply chain and content management. I've worked in education tech, even worked in drones in the private space industry. Uh, what I'm most well known for is Box. I've managed their developer platform for about five years. Um, but also trade shift in the supply chain invoicing space. It's another unicorn I'm allowed to talk about. And I have wound up quite a bit working in the fintech space. Currently, I'm working for Deserve. It's a credit card platform, managing their APIs and core product. I've also supported a group called the Fintech Portfolio and just advised many fintech startups as they worked on APIs. So basically, I like APIs, and naturally, I've been pulled into fintech quite a bit lately. Now, before I get into the trends of what I've been generally seeing in fintech APIs, let's get into a little bit of that recent history of where things have been for uh, fintech APIs. I'm going to go back a lot more than a decade here to something called EDI, the Electronic Data Interchange. Not sure how many of you have worked with this before. Um, for those who have, FYI, there's um, a meetup group, an API meetup group just for you. It's this uh, group of therapy for those who have a PTSD and suffer recurring nightmares from having worked with EDI. Uh, just kidding. EDI had its value. It basically was a standard for API for communication of financial information. This is still highly relevant when it comes to invoicing. It came up often for banking. But the idea was to have some messaging standard to get to get financial information across. As you can see, it goes way back to the world of paper mail and fax. So in the world of computers, this was really a pain to work with. I do know someone who uh, actually still likes EDI, this evil red spiky fellow over here. Um, just kidding. Basically, EDI served its purpose. It set the idea of having an API standard, but it's not something you really want to have to work with. So hopefully we could do better than that. Now, let's move a few years ahead from EDI, but to what's still a fairly recent past, uh, going back just a little bit over 10 years. Um, I hope a few of you have gotten to try out the service mint.com. It was basically an early personal finance web service where you could connect your bank accounts, your credit card information, your brokerages, and they could just keep track of your finances. They could let you know if you're spending too much in one category. They could let you know how your investments are doing. Um, now, in order to do this, 
they just needed your login information, username, and your password for every single one of your financial institutions. And then they would go and site scrape. So basically, you had a security risk here. You had to trust that Mint could keep track of all your passwords and information safely. Uh, also, quite frequently, these connections wouldn't work since they're really hacking these websites. And also, if you ever needed to change your password for any one bank, Mint would go haywire. Basically, it was a great idea, but uh, due to the lack of APIs, the experience sucked a lot. And why was it the case just a little bit over 10 years ago that we had this, this situation? Basically, as API started to open up with that 2009 API craze, banks were slow to move on it. And, you know, why was that? Well, let's go and talk to some banks. This summarizes the bank's response to APIs. Basically, they really wanted to just hold on to the data. They felt there was too much value in them keeping the data. They didn't want to make this kind of stuff accessible. During the API craze, many companies learned that if they just opened up, worked with other services, built ecosystems around what they have, they could grow even further if they shared. Banks really didn't like that. But eventually, they caught on and decided to open up on their own accord. Just kidding. What really happened was uh, the legal path. Basically, governments came along and said, okay, banks, you have to start opening up. Europe was big for the PSD2 um, regulation for electronic payment services, basically re requiring that dumb payments be more secure but also to boost innovation and just get banks to adapt new technology. Over in the U.S., we had, uh, we're big on open banking, um, which is basically um, a set of regulations that was telling banks that they needed to open up. They need to make their data accessible to their users. The rules did not explicitly state that you need APIs. They didn't set any standards for APIs, but they basically said to banks, you have to open up your data. And APIs were logically the right thing to do next. So thanks to government intervention, basically, financial institutions have started to open up. And the result? Yay. For Mint.com, we no longer have to, or services like Mint, we no longer have to site scrape. Instead, we can work with APIs. We can utilize OAuth so that we can connect with our banks and our credit card information, our brokerages, without having to share our passwords. And because these connections happen through APIs, we have more reliability, um, a better experience. These things aren't breaking down all the time. So basically, thanks to open APIs, that force of newer technology, the utilization of modern API standards, we now have integrations that are more usable, more reliable, and with better security. In other words, it's really quite a groovy time. Yes, this is a Canadian person, a Brit, which I guess I can do because I am technically Canadian and API Days London. Anywho, we have this great thing going finally, thanks to some pressure on the financial institutions. What else is going on in the world of fintech in parallel? Well, basically, a bunch of people who know API started to enter the space. And we started seeing some really good tech pop up improve what happens when you bring new tech in the financial world and especially start going the API route. Banks were really difficult about it and eventually had to move while at the same time in other parts of fintech, new companies just popped up. And you know what? They also set a really high bar. Uh, these standards, these APIs, they're high. They're good quality, highly competitive APIs. Uh, and after all, Stripe is known to have been the founder of the three-column API documentation that's basically the expected standard for good solid APIs across the board. Um, so going beyond fintech, these companies are really setting standards in what you should expect in a good developer experience. They're raising the bar not just in fintech, but across the rest of the API industry. So that means that if you're coming into this space, building a fintech API, you have high expectations in your customers now. Whether or not these are direct competitors, the stripes and the plaids of the world, 
it's expected to have a good solid API. That may mean, you know, maybe more difficult for you. I'm much happier about that because I like seeing good APIs. But at the same time, you have good benchmarks. When you're on this space, when you're working on your APIs, you can look at what other fintech APIs are doing, and they're making it easier for you to design your APIs well by not only raising the bar, but providing good samples for how to create good APIs in this space. And that's what I want to get into next. I want to advocate not necessarily about copying your competitors' technology, but in the world of APIs, I'm an advocate of getting even your competitors to have similar APIs so that developers come along and they can interact more easily between all services. Ideally, this leads to standards. So what kind of standards are we seeing in the world of FinTech as we have all these top-notch APIs uh, coming in here and trying to get things growing and moving? Well, there are industry standards. Um, unfortunately, most of the standards I see go back to that old school, the days of APIs or the lower layers of the world of APIs. ISO 222, ISO 8583. These are things I'm encountering in the world of credit cards. Um, ISO 8583 is basically a messaging standard when you're swiping your credit card and going through a payment gateway and getting everything processed and settled. So standards are there as a form of messaging between hardware or between banks when it comes to performing ACH transactions or EDI. Um, but what happens when it comes to those REST APIs, those usable higher level APIs for those who are just trying to build good user, good customer experiences? Well, in that world, unfortunately, like what we see in most of the API industry today, is that these API designs really don't have rules. They're more guidelines. Many of us dream of seeing not only APIs that go with that RESTful standard, but more consistency in our naming conventions, in our properties, so that when someone's working with various services in the same industry, it's just much, much easier to build an app that connects to many APIs. Now, on the positive, I am seeing some trends, some patterns, and that's what I want to show you today. Where are the areas in FinTech APIs where this consistency has already naturally happened? So that if you're building an API, you want to utilize this and go with what has kind of become the de facto standard. Uh, and then where we haven't necessarily seen that consistency yet, but we still want to keep a lookout. As a simple example here, if we look at Plaid, Marketa, Stripe, some of the bigger the fintech APIs, there are certain things in their APIs, if you look at all of them, that are consistent. Uh, it comes up when we're looking at um, property value types. For example, any sort of currency is done as a neutral int or long. They're not applying floats. They figured out to just um, go down to your bottom currency, but keep it as, as an integer, keep them as whole numbers. I've worked for several FinTech companies that are debating how to manage their currencies. Sometimes they want floating point operations. I show them this slide, they understand, do what everyone else has figured out, make this simple on the developer, store less space, have something that's consistent where unfortunately I'm not yet seeing that sort of consistency I would love is when it comes to endpoint names, the actual object returns in our APIs, the, um, the um, results. For example, when it comes to say returning an account balance, if you look at Stripe and Marketa today, you're gonna see certain consistencies, but these are definitely not the same structure nor do they have the same kind of naming conventions for currency codes. Uh, so there's a lot here that they've still done on their own. Now, for these companies, sometimes they're updating their APIs and they may not even have consistency across their own versions. What's happening here is that everyone's still just figuring things out. Uh, and so this is an area where I'd say when you're working on your API function definitions, your output definitions, go and benchmark what the others are doing keep a lookout because I do see that over time these are actually getting closer and closer and at the very least you can design your APIs to be as close as possible to others 
to make things as easy as possible on your developers if they're working with your service and other fintech APIs. Going a little bit higher level than, say, open API definitions and function definitions, there are certain things, certain properties to just expect in fintech APIs. Like, basically, they've all figured out that you need item potency in your APIs. Uh, if in your service you have to make a payment, you want to make sure that when you make that post request, if you don't get a return, that you're not making a payment twice. So item potency has just been a huge deal across the board. Everyone's figured that bit out. Also, when it comes to authentication, thanks to the magic of OAuth, we are seeing some consistency here. Um, basically, all APIs want to go on the latest OAuth standard. They're applying the latest levels of security. I find consistent consistently, although OAuth 2 does not require um, encrypted secrets. They all have encrypted secrets, all these APIs. Um, but yeah, they're all sticking to the OAuth standard, at least when it comes to client-server interactions. That is where there's something, and we have an interface that you are displaying directly to a consumer, OAuth comes along. But there is something else that we're seeing. It's very, very common in our APIs here to have more server-to-server -server interactions. Over at Marketa, sometimes a user is interacting with a mobile app that goes straight to the Marketa APIs. But more often, um, the user is actually interacting with the partner who's making calls from the partner servers to the Marketa API. So the client, the user, never actually has any way of seeing the API calls to Marketa. Uh, Stripe has a similar experience. And in their cases, they're not going to have <clears throat> your most common OAuth flow. Instead, they have more of the basic username password authentication. Um, now, what I've interestingly seen here across the board is they've designed their APIs to primarily have basic authentication, but whenever they've implemented anything client-facing, they have OAuth. So you see that in the Marketa documentation, the Stripe documentation, they'll say, under these circumstances, we are going to have OAuth when it's client-facing. So there is OAuth, there's basic authentication, this is something that I've seen trending more, not necessarily something that I saw in the APIs five years ago, but a bigger thing now. Um, basically, authorization, setting your permissions. In uh, the world of FinTech, it's pretty common to have something more B2B-ish, something we have administration. And so uh, you're going to need to have more granular permissioning across your APIs, regardless of whether you're going by OAuth. Some APIs I can literally see, based on their structure, they didn't initially have this, and they figured out the hard way that they need to have a very strong system for authorization and granular permissioning. So I strongly advise when you're working on your APIs, don't just focus on authentication from the beginning, focus on authorization and really think through when users are interacting, what should they not have access to. Uh, finally, in the world of just patterns and trends, they've all figured out sandbox. Seems like a no-brainer here. Um, if someone is, say, working on credit cards and they need to test the ability to report a car lost or stolen, they don't want their car to actually be lost or stolen when they're testing. Over at Stripe, when you're making a payment and you want to make sure that payment's going through, you have to test on our times. You don't actually want payments to happen. So, yeah, sandboxes, just assume you're going to need those. I want to wrap up here by talking about one other aspect of APIs. Not just establishing good standards for those building APIs, but enabling those sort of connectors. And the benefit of what happens when you have API consistency. The Stripes, Marketas, uh, Squares of the world, they're getting consistent with their own APIs. Thanks to open banking and companies stepping in to help financial institutions to create their APIs naturally, because it's often one company building those APIs from multiple banks, you're going to see some consistency in the APIs. And when you allow that, you have things like this, Plaid Exchange. So... In order to support, I want to encourage anyone working in this space to think, what can you do to encourage companies to make their APIs more consistent? 
Plaid, for instance, opened up Plaid Exchange. Plaid is basically a way of connecting users to multiple banks. Um, so they can say, here are, they can, you know, to any financial app like, uh, like Mint, they can connect to multiple banks, multiple brokerages, and share the information as they choose. It's a lot easier to have something like this when financial institutions are consistent in their APIs. And Plaid now has enough leverage to say, hey, we have a system for anyone to come along and integrate with us freely, more easily. You just have to design your APIs according to our requirements to actually integrate. And that's what Plaid Exchange is about. Other banks can just go to Plaid to integrate. They just have to design their APIs according to Plaid's requirements. And this is something I always love to see. We have that sort of leverage. And uh, do, that, do what you can then to encourage others to design their APIs in a consistent standard. So we've got to wrap up here, and I want to think a minute or two over. So I'm just going to say thank you all for putting up with me uh, this evening or this morning, depending on wherever you are. Again, financial APIs with open API, JSON, and standards will make the world a better place. Hi, Jeremy. It's time for some questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with you. Let's make the world a better place with APIs. We don't need only APIs to do that, but yeah, at least if APIs can do their part, uh, why not? Uh, we, we have a... Uh, we have we have a first question from Nick here. Uh, is there a solution uh, for this jungle of uh, you know managing all these new versions of this version and new versions of API platforms? He takes he takes an example here and say, for example, oh your API ecosystem does not work with the, uh, the does not work at all with the new versions, right? You know, for or something. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to read. Example: your API ecosystem does not work at all with the new version. Uh, he asks if there is a solution to manage this uh, jungle of new version of API platforms? Um, so a new version of API platforms being when APIs are launching a new version on the versioning. I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Hold on a second, let me hop let's over say, to it. In this let's, say that, let's say that as you show, there are many, many designs around and all these designs probably have new versions at some point, right? You know, like I think Stripe has more than 70 versions, right? Or stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, so how how is there a solution to manage all of this? And is this is someone integrating with Stripe, or if you're in Stripe's position where you're creating no. that many versions and managing those versions? Let's say let's say that uh, for now you're a consumer, you're an API consumer. We'll take the providers part later. But let's say for example now you're a consumer, you consume few uh, payment fintech APIs, right? And actually there are many many versions. How do you manage all these versions together? All right, so you're a consumer of the APIs, and we'll assume you're also not attempting some sort of an aggregation tool. So you're building an app, and that app is working with, say, the Stripe API and, and other APIs. But I'd say in this industry, you're at a slight advantage over others because Stripe, um, Square, they've shown more developer empathy. Stripe is emphatic that they have all these versions, and they are maintaining and supporting those versions. If they've had to make a breaking change to their API and release a new version, they make sure that the old API still works and the documentation is still there. So when you're working on an API, you know, the good news is if a new version comes along, you can choose whether to move on to that new version if it's going to be a breaking change, or in general, you cho can choose to stick to the current version. The FinTech APIs have set a high bar there, both in ease of implementation and in the maintenance of the old versions of their APIs. Yeah, and now maybe uh, I understood the question better. Uh, now, as now you are a new provider, how do you make sure your APIs are kind of consistent with what's already there, if it's not consistent at all? Okay. Right? So how then do you make design decisions? So yeah, so as a provider, I would say this is actually a difficult thing to manage. And it, for me, it was actually kind of scary initially hearing how many versions of the API Stripe had and maintained. Uh, many other industries companies would just sunset those old APIs. Um, it's not really expected to maintain 70 versions of your APIs if you have to, but they're willing to do it, and it's very difficult to do. Uh, and I can give another, actually give another talk on API frameworks and the API tech stack, and how API design development launching, it's easier now. And with that, it's easier to maintain all versions of your APIs as well. Um, 
But as a, I, I say as a general tip, two tips. One, utilize new technology. That's a long conversation. Um, but the other is, you know, try to design your APIs well in the first place such that updates to your APIs aren't going to be breaking and don't require a new version. Uh, you know, Stripe, I think they had to do it because, you know, they had to learn what was going to work for their customers. I think versioning, it may even be slowing down for them as they have a better sense of what actually is a fit. You know, if you're coming in and looking at what Stripe does and what Square does, okay, well, you may have a better, you may be able to learn from what they've already done to design your APIs well the first time so that you can make updates that aren't going to create breaks and ideally minimize the need for new versioning. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. I also think at some point uh, design will be a competitive advantage when uh, the more the API and the service are a commodity, the more design actually to integrate will be a competitive advantage to others. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Thank you for waking up so early, right?